Everybody here for beyond user stories, right? If anybody thinks that they're not, they're at the wrong session, don't worry, I'm glad your subconscious got you to the right place. So I'm very glad that you guys are here. So uh, good morning, Agile India, right? I, I can't hear it. Good morning, Agile India. And the breakfast is not kicking in. <laughs> Has the dark side of collaboration kind of got you down? It's like, no, we're not going to collaborate. We're going to sit our separate ways, and we're not going to participate, right? That's not going on, right? All right, good, good. All right, so uh, today's session is about beyond user stories. How do, we take our, uh, how do we take our team to the next level of awesome? Uh, in this session, I'm going to be talking about a case study, uh, which I've kind of done it, and I've kind of transformed a, a portfolio of team uh, into a more outcome-based model or outcome way of thinking. All right, so I have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Uh, so uh, let's get kind of started. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a culture hacker uh, because I don't like the word agile coach. So I think culture hacker is a lot more cooler, so I kind of go with culture hacker. Uh, I am also a speaker. I speak at a lot of different scrum and agile groups. I speak at a, a lot of meetups. I speak at a lot of different conferences. I'm also a guest lecturer at Arizona State University. I talk about lean mindset and design thinking, so I speak over there as well. Uh, I'm also a doodler. Uh, did anybody catch my sketch note on yesterday's keynote? Did anybody see that? All right, a couple of people did. All right, cool. Uh, so I, I love doing that. I, I love doing sketch notes and doodling. Uh, and when time permits, I'm also an enterprise agile coach. Uh, I tweet a lot of good stuff on my Twitter handle at Agile Bright Spot. I'm also on the LinkedIn. And it's the exact same picture on LinkedIn, so you guys don't get confused who I am. All right. Uh, I also belong to a, a really cool bunch of uh, guys. I'm a part of Intra Edge Technology Services, and we are a, uh, a Scaled Agile Bronze Partner. Shout out to my Scaled Agile team over there. Woohoo! All right. So all the Scaled Agile people decided to show up over here. So I'm actually very happy about that. They're giving me some like. They said they were going to heckle, but I think they're not going to do that. They're going to support me. Uh, so we do a lot of agile transformations. Uh, we have a lot of different trainings, training in uh, leading safe, uh, safe BMO, safe Scrum XP. Uh, and if you're not interested in that, we also let you borrow our awesome coaches and culture hackers to bring into your uh, teams and portfolios uh, so we can bring our awesomeness and spread the awesomeness in your team. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. So let's kind of get started with uh, where it all started. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I was called into this uh, this portfolio and it, it, this large financial organization. Now contractually, I'm obligated to not say their name, so I'm not going to say their name. But it's a large financial organization. It's a Forbes top 50 or a Fortune top 50 company. So they called me in, uh, and uh, it was a day-long interview. Believe it or not, it was a day-long interview, and I was supposed to meet with a uh, different segment uh, of the hierarchy. So I was supposed to meet with the leaders in the morning, the VPs uh, and so on, directors and so on. Then I was supposed to meet with their uh, scrum masters. Then I was supposed to meet with their product owners and so on, their teams and so on and so forth. So it was a pretty exhaustive uh, uh, ordeal. And I was actually very happy about that, that they actually wanted me to meet uh, all this different segment. And then we'll mutually make a call whether we want to do this or not. So uh, the very first thing, uh, when I went over there, I met with their leaders over there. Uh, and the conversation started by saying that, uh, Kelpesh, we understand the importance of Agile. You don't need to sell us Agile over here. We've already drank that Kool-Aid. We have no problems with it. We have heavily empowered our teams. We have gotten all our teams have gone through a lot of Scrum training. Uh, about a year ago, we also brought in a bunch of coaches to kind of coach them, kind of get them going on this journey. Uh, and uh, we are now ready to basically take our team to that next level. So I was like, all right, this sounds like a plan. Uh, and I said, well, OK, we'll, we'll see what we can do over here. Next uh, was the Scrum Masters. There were Scrum Masters and Project Managers. So they kind of came in, and they sat down with me. There were four of them who sat down with me. They were part of this interviewing committee. And they proudly opened up their rally. And uh, they showed me that, Kalpesh, uh, we are doing fairly good as far as the team is con considered. Uh, our uh, burn down charts are, I mean, our velocity charts are fantastic. Look at this. In the last 10 sprints, we haven't missed a single story. We have always been true to our commitments. We are just based on our velocity. We are just based on our capacity. Uh, we, we have this down. I said, that's good. That's very good. Uh, but one of them said, you know what? 
but I don't believe in velocity. I think it's all about throughput. That's where it's at. I said, that's great. And he showed me his throughput charts. Here, look at this, our team's throughput charts, and we really monitor that, and it's about how many stories you dish out. Velocity is just a number. It's about throughput. I said, that, that looks fantastic. I mean, you guys have got, you guys have got it down. That's really great. Uh, so they showed me this throughput charts over time. I said, fantastic. The other scrum master said, you know what, this is all nonsense. It's, Agile is all about time to market, right? Who cares about what our velocity is? Who cares about how many stories we finish? It's all about time to market. And I'm gonna show you my cycle lead times. So they showed me their cycle lead time, and that was pretty darn good. I mean, they were finishing their stories in less than a week. By the way, does everybody know what a cycle lead time is? Who does not know what cycle lead time is? All right, cycle lead time is a time it takes for a story to go from in progress to accepted or done, right? So that's what they were monitoring. So they're kind of monitoring that data and saying, yeah, I mean, we have it, we have it down. Our cycle lead time is fantastic. I mean, we have it under four or five, five days. Uh, we have it great. So they said, oh, that's actually fantastic. You guys have really good data. You guys are doing some really good work over here. Uh, and then they said, you know what? Now, uh, let's, let's take you to our floor. Let's take you to our environment. Uh, and, and one of the scrum masters said, we'll take you to our Gemba. So I was pleasantly surprised. I'm like, oh, that's actually great. You guys know what you're talking about. Does anybody know what Gemba is? So Gemba is a, it's a lean terminology, or it's a lean, wo a lean word, and it says it's a place of action, where the action really happens, right? Or the floor, right? Where everything is happening, right? So they said, we'll take you to our Gemba. So it at least told me that these guys were reading up on stuff. They at least knew what was going on. So we said, all right, let's, let's look at your environment. Uh, and they had all open collaborative workspaces. Now I know you guys came from the dark side of collaboration, and some of you might have switched the side today, I don't know, but uh, that looked pretty good to me. I mean, it is, it's an open floor. Uh, people were having their own desk, but they were also collaborating. Everybody can talk to each other. These guys are voluntarily collaborating around whiteboard, uh, whiteboard. so I was pretty impressed looking at that. Uh, so like, that's, that's great, that's fantastic. Uh, so you know what? Our teams are all co-located. We are co-located teams, they're all here. I said, more power to you. So, wait, it gets even better. We have co-located product owners, be that. Uh, I said, that's even better. You guys have co-located product owners. That's fantastic. What more could a team ask for? And the teams are doing all their agile ceremonies together, their daily stand-ups, sprint planning, sprint reviews, retrospective. They're doing it all together. Uh, so I was like, all right, that's fantastic. Uh, and then in the back of my head, I'm like, I bet you you guys are not doing anything about that CI, CD, and technical agility stuff. So I'm like, okay, I'll probably sell you on that. Uh, and the next thing they dish out is like, oh yeah, yeah we already, we are, we are on to our technical agility too. We have a lot of automation testing in place. Uh, we are already actively working towards that. Uh, we have CI, CD, and one-click deploy in action, and we regularly address our technical debt. Uh, we even have a negotiation with our product owners where 70% of our backlog is features, and 30% of our backlog is technical issues. So I was like, all right, that's, that sounds like, that sounds pretty good. So as far as metrics and environment was concerned, these guys were rock stars. These guys were freaking rock stars. Uh, I'm basically standing over there and scratching my head, and if you guys are anything like me, I am wondering over there, why the, what the fuck, why, the, why do you guys call me? Why do you guys need me here? You guys have it all figured out. So why am I here? So, uh, all right, so I'm like, okay, I'll play along. The day is coming along, and now I'm wondering, like, how am I gonna justify my existence over here, right? Uh, so, all right, I said, let's, let's play along. Let's, let's meet more people, right? I mean, what do you guys have going on? So, I met with the, the product owners or the product directors. I said, tell me more about what do you do? It's like, yeah, Kalpesh, you know what? Uh, we take feedback from our users, uh, we come up with ideas, uh, and then we work with our design team, and we come up with a, a, a solution. I said, all right, that sounds like the right thing to do. No problem over there. Uh, and the, the technology team or the technology director said, well, we take that solution, uh, we do some release planning, we, we have our release planning sessions, we bucket them out, uh, we build it, uh, we, we keep our product owners involved, and we, we ship it in, like, you know, three sprints, four sprints, however long it takes, we kind of ship it. I'm like, all right, you guys are doing the right thing. So, you know, in a, about two or three months, uh, a quarter or less than quarter, uh, we are able to dish it out, we are able to launch our stuff to the market, uh, so the project uh, is on time, it's within budget, done in an agile way. Uh, so that's, that's great. 
Uh, the product owner is happy. I mean, they like what they see. They've they've been very much involved, uh, and the product delivery director is happy because hey, they delivered on their commitment. But there was one problem. There was one problem. The users are still not happy. The users are still confused. It's hit and a miss, you know, Kalpesh. Sometimes they love our stuff. Sometimes they don't love our stuff. So I'm like, aha, that's where I had my moment. I said, okay, I I get it. I think I know where the problem is because. When the team is committing to a whole bunch of features or a whole bunch of stories or whatnot, all they've got is to persevere through it. There is no room for pivoting, right? So tons of output, but how are we measuring this thing? I know you guys are doing a fantastic job with your user stories. You guys are dishing stories out like there is no tomorrow. You guys are a mean green story machine. I get it. You guys are proud of it, no doubt about that. But do you guys know what the what what did the outcome? And they're like, well. Not really. We, we don't know that. Some of the higher up people knew what outcomes they were driving for. Team said no clue about it. I said, all right. I said, let's look under the hood a little bit. So at the end of the day, I was at least able to give this smart comment, and I was able to justify my place over there. So I said, all right, we'll bring you in. You said something really smart, we'll bring you in. I'm like, all right, let's, let's spend some time with your teams. So let's look under the hood. right? Uh, and I asked, where do stories come from? So I actually want to ask you guys. Not you, but think about your teams. If you ask your team, where do stories come from, what would they say? Guesses? Product owner, I love it. Anybody else? Where do stories come from? End users, OK, I love it. Anybody else wants to take a stab at it? Where do stories come from? Oh, they, they won't even come. <laughs> I don't know. Man. They just they, they come from somewhere. Oh, they won't even come. We just figured it out. We started working on it. All right. So here is when I asked the teams, right, where do stories really come from? I heard all kinds of answers. Well, the product owner, the PO finds it for us. Uh, the PO brings it for us, right? Uh, they, some of them said they give it to us, right? That, that doesn't even come. I don't know. They just, it just comes, right? But this was my, my, my Hall of Fame answer was, Dude, just, just give me the story and I'll code for it. Just give me the story and I'll code for it. That's the answer. I'm like, oh my god. So all right, I said, OK, let's, let's chug along. And I said, well, OK, uh, let's take it a level above right, and see what's really going on. So I asked them, well, what's wrong with your product? So what is wrong with your product? right? I asked them. So a whole bunch of them said, well, uh, we need more refactoring. Uh, we need more automation. Uh, we need to use React and not Angular. Uh, we need to like a lot of we have a lot of dead code um, going on over here. Uh, and, and one of the guy, hoping that I was give him some prize, said we need more lean architecture. Uh, I said, <laughs> okay, I get it, but nobody really talked about the product. Nobody did talk about the product. Nobody. When I asked them, how many of you have actually seen your product being used by the users or by your users in their habitat? Any guesses how many people? Zero percent. Zero percent had actually seen their product in action. And some of these guys have been working in that company for almost 10 years, very proud of it. They had those plaques over there saying that five years, 10 years, 15 years, or whatnot, never seen their product in action. When I asked them, well, do you know what, 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 pro what part of the product your users love and what they hate? Well, no, never really. We don't know that. That's where the problem was. They never knew. They'd never seen it in action. They had no idea what, what their product, what, what they loved about it, what they hate about it, how they use it, where the problem is. I have no idea. Just give me the story. I'll code for it. I've got the, I've got the story part down. I can do this thing all day long. right? So that was the problem. So I'm going to digress a little bit, and I'm going to share an interesting fact with you guys. So I was reading this book uh, from um, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Coey on the eighth habit, and he says only 37% uh, in a company, and he actually interviewed like 23,000 people from different company, uh, and said they found only 37% uh, said that they had a clear understanding of what their organization is trying to do, right? Uh, only one in five were enthusiastic about it. Uh, only one in five said that they had a clear line of sight between their task and what the organizational goals are, and only 15% felt that their organization fully enables them to execute key goals. And 20% full, only 20% fully trusted their organization. 
just a bunch of statistics, I can't connect to this thing. There's 23,000 people. So let me bring a little bit more context to your world. So for a moment, what I want you guys to do is think about your team as a soccer team, all right? So put on that, put on that thinking hat and think for a moment that the scrum teams that you're belonging to is actually a soccer team. So is everybody imagining that your team is a soccer team? Just raise your hand saying, yes, we are doing it. We are imagining our team as a soccer team, all right? So think of your team as a soccer team, all right? Only four of the 11 players on the field would know which goal is theirs. All right? Only two of the 11 would care. Right? Only two of the 11 would know what position they play and exactly know what they're supposed to do. Right? And all but two players would in some way be competing against their own team members rather than their opponent. And we actually know that what it's called, right? We've seen it a lot in IPL, right? We've seen that in IPL, right? We know how this goes down, right? This is what's happening with your team. And when I showed this to the leadership, they were like, what the hell? I said, this is where the problem is. Yeah, they're all playing the games, but they have no clue which side of the ball. I'm just called in to kick the ball. I will just score the stories. I will score that all day long. I'll just keep kicking the ball, but dude, where is the ball going? Are we scoring any goals or not? Are we winning the game or not? I don't know that. I'm just supposed to hit the ball, right? That's where the challenge is, right? So I'm like, okay, so, so you can now take the hat back, or are you guys still thinking about your team and the soccer team? <laughs> You're like, damn it, this is true. It's happening in my team. How many of you actually connect to this thing? Did, I, did anybody felt like, oh my god, my team is doing that? I think I could have cared. <laughs> So, and again, I actually got this data from uh, Made to Stick book, so I mean, that's where I got this data from, and I, I like, this is so true, this is so true, right? So, that's where I kind of went around and I said, okay, I kinda, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm on to something over here, but I want to put my finger on this thing. So, what I did was I, I drew the Scrum framework on the board, and I asked the teams, uh, tell me what your perception is, right? So, uh, what do you think happens here before stuff comes into the backlog? Right? So I want to actually ask you guys, not you, but think about what your team would say, right? If you asked your team, well, what do you think happens before the stuff comes into the backlog? What do you think your team members would say? I don't know. The portfolio managers, okay, I love it. I mean, the, the scaled agile guys are going to be like, wait, 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 yes, that is right, the portfolio. Good. The product owner comes up with the requirements. Magic happens before. It's magic. And actually, one of the guys told me the product owner consults the Oracle. There's a magic eight ball, they shake it, and they find, okay, this is the next thing that we gotta work on. That is what's happening. That's how they perceive it to be, right? I said, all right, this is, this is good. Now we're kinda going somewhere with this thing. Uh, what do you think happens here once you dish stuff out? Once stuff has gone into production? What do you think your teams would say? I love it. One of the guys said, production issues happen. They actually said production issues. Production issues happen, right? That's a scary thought. It's a black hole. I don't know what happened. I dished it out, right? And actually, I'm going to give it away to you guys. So these, this company has changed one of their interview questions. So now when they interview engineers, they actually ask a question now uh, to whoever is coming and said, where do you think your responsibility as an engineer starts? And where do you think your responsibility ends? Right? You don't have to answer it right now. This is their way of now gauging, like, you know, who are we really getting, right? This is what's happening. I mean, yeah, what happens afterwards? Production issues. Simple as that. Production issues come, we fix it, it goes back into our backlog, we size it, and it goes through our cycle again. But all right. So that's when I kind of thought, well, okay, I think we got we to gotta work, we got to look at this from a different angle. So that's where I kind of got an aha moment. My aha moment was, Delivery feels a lot more better to these guys. They're in the mode of delivery. They're more, they're a mean green story machine. That feels better, but learning feels weird to these guys. Learning felt very weird to these guys. It was basically, they were always asked the question, can it be built? But I needed, we needed to now shift our thought process. It's not can it be built, it's should it be built. That is what we should be focusing on. That is where that is where you will kind of go on that soccer field and you will be kicking the ball in the right direction. That's the question we should be asking. Should it be built, right? So they had 
phenomenally optimized for the build part. They were superly optimized for build, but had no clue about measure and learn. This part of the loop completely did not exist for those guys. It just did not exist for those guys, right? So that's where that and that's where I kind of started off with those guys. So I again put the uh, Scrum framework and I asked the question: Let's open the boundaries of the Scrum framework a little bit. Let's open the boundaries a little bit and let's expose these guys and make them participate or take ownership into the stuff that happens before. Because when I ask with the product owner, product owner, what do you think happens before this? Well, we define our outcomes, we have a lot of hypotheses that we generate, we have user labs, we'll do empathy mapping, uh, we have A-B test designs or whatnot, and I said, okay, well, let's make our team a part of this process. They need to be exposed to this thing so they understand why I came to work today, right? Actually, you won't believe it, there was a whole analytics team that was observing, uh, calculating stuff on how, or like how are the users reacting. It was in India and they did not even know it existed. Nobody knew that team existed. There was an experimentation and test and learn team that was in place. Nobody knew that team existed. They had no idea the team existed. Only the product owner knew about it. They were basically operating in silos. They were agile, but they were agile in silos. That's where the challenge was. So I said, you know what? Uh, let's open it up. Let's make them part of the outcome definition. So I, I told my product owner, I says, you know what, let's play along with me. Uh, let's actually bring these guys in and let's, them, let, let's make them part of the outcome definition. And what I did was, and I'm so sorry, the picture turned out to be very bright, but what they're doing over here is they, we basically mapped stuff out and we put things over here. So we kind of listed our outcome over here, uh, who can help us with this, how they can help us, and what features we will create. So as a team, we basically mapped the journey. We mapped the journey and said, okay, well, we're gonna put the outcome on the left-hand side. This is what the outcome we're trying to achieve. Now, together as a team, we are gonna brainstorm how will we reach the features, okay? So you are connected on what the journey is. The very first session I had, uh, all the engineers came, they sat down, and the product owner kind of went about it. I said, That's not how we do it, right? So very first session, the engineers felt, the team felt so uncomfortable with this thing. They're like, I, I, I'm not able to come up with a lot of ideas. So the first time around, the product owner did a lot of driving. The next session we had, the team slowly started coming to the table. Okay, I get it. I know how this exercise works. Let me participate in this stuff. They were now chalking stuff out, saying, okay, if this is the outcome, this is who can help us with it. This is how they can help us with this stuff. And this is the, these are the features that we need to put out if we need to achieve this, uh, this outcome. The very first time I did this, it was just they all the, all of them together, it's just one team and, and doing it. Next time around our experiment, I said, okay, let's split into two teams, right? A team, you guys do this exercise, and you guys do this exercise. And what was happening, they were coming up with all these great ideas, but well, how will we test this? How will we measure this? So I, we kind of experimented that again, and I said, okay, in this mix, I will call that person from analytics and that person will be a part of this exercise as well. So now they start understanding, oh, before I put a feature out, I need to figure out how this will be measured, right? So they start interacting with these guys, right? So we slowly we started changing the definition of our scrum team now. We slowly started changing the definition of a scrum team. So they started now, and after that, we had a design team. So we started to add a design team member to this discussion, right? So now it was a designer, it was the analytics team, and the engineering team, who are sitting over there and figuring out how do we go from our outcome to actually our features. They were addressing the question, is this feasible? Is this doable? Can we measure this thing? Can we test this thing? It's all being done over here. And by the way, do you know how long these sessions would last? Make a guess. One hour. One hour is all I need, because when I kind of pitch this, pitch this idea, do you, uh, what's the first question I would, been, I would have been asked by the, uh, the Scrum Master Project Managers? What do you think they would have asked? <laughs> My resources will be wasting their time over here, right? I said, all I need is an hour. An hour, one hour is all I need. Let's see where this takes us. And this idea really caught on. So once we have figured out what features we wanted, what we did was we started doing design studios. I said, all right, we've got a features. Now actually let's do design. The, by the way, do you guys know what design studios are? Or UX sessions are? How many of you know what they are? 
All right, so a couple of here. So a design studio is where uh, the the design team member and the, he's our our hipster designs uh, design design guru over here. He's a designer. We actually flew in from New York. He actually now flies in every once a month to sit with the team and do this exercise with them. But at first, I kind of cracked the deal. Said, "Can you do it once a month or once a quarter with me?" So this guy flew in, and what they do is they actually put the problem on the wall. They would say, "Okay, this is the feature that we want to create. Uh, can we design a couple of options over here?" So what he was doing was he was actually sharing design thought process or design thinking process with the team members. He kind of showed them. And what they did was they started coming up with three different options for that feature. If we, had to, if we had to create this feature, let's come up with three different options. How are we going to create this feature? right? And here is a product owner. She's taking notes over here. These are two of the engineers uh, that are part of the team. There were others over there, but they were a little camera shy. So they said, OK, if you're going to put this on a conference uh, screen or whatnot, we don't want to be a part of it. I said, all right, no problem. Uh, so these were engineers, and again, how long did it take? An hour. I don't need more time. I just want an hour. If we're taking more than an hour to figure this thing out, we're doing something wrong. We are going into analysis paralysis, and that's fundamentally wrong. So I just can we can we quickly come up with? And these are paper prototype. It's a big easel pad, and we kind of draw it out. Refining it was my 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 designer's job. He sat there and he came up with nice little prototypes after that. All right. So we started making them a part of design studios. We were doing this together. And after that, and this is the real kicker, this is where we were having a rapid user lab sessions. So this is where we kind of said, OK, our, our rapid user lab sessions, the, the teams actually got to see you, the users interacting with the prototypes they had created. The three prototypes that I kind of showed you with this picture over here, they actually now dished it out. And they're actually getting customer feedback. And if you look at this screen, I'm going to spend some time showing the, the way this is set up. So this is the screen. This is the prototype that's over here. They're able to see the, the user over here. And there's a chat going on with the person who's moderating this session. So there's a chat going on with those guys as well. Uh, what we did was we listed the features over here. What features are we actually dishing out? What are the hypotheses that we are trying to validate? right? And if there are any notes, we're kind of capturing that over here. right? Uh, now I want you guys to actually take a good look at this picture. And I want you guys to pay attention to the body language. Right? Uh, this is the guy who actually built, who came up with the, the idea or the, the feature or the prototype. Looking at the, car, at, the, at the user's reaction, this guy couldn't even sit down. He's like, dude, it's right there. Why are you not clicking? Come on, man, look at this stuff. That guy couldn't even sit down. That's how involved this person was. He couldn't, he couldn't fan them that the stuff that he had created or was about to build, the users were not getting it. The users were just not getting it. This guy right here, he's my uh, uh, Scrum Master project manager. Any comment on his body language? The guy is super worried. Why? Why, why would he be super worried? What? <laughs> no. This is the stuff I had lined up in my backlog two sprints from now, and it's getting thrown out. And what's the biggest worry of a project manager? Funding and amount of work. If I don't have that, what will my team do? I don't have a team. I don't have funding. What will my team be doing over there? This guy was worried, scared, sitting over here. He's like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Because our stuff is getting thrown out of the walls right now. right? But one very interesting stuff happened. Uh, this lady right here, she's our QA person, right? And what happened was she made a very interesting observation while these rapid lab sessions were going on. One of the features that we showed them was actually a mobile view of, of our application, of our product. And as soon as we showed that prototype to the user, the user did something very interesting. The user stood up. And he actually took that thing on their hand and they started moving around. Anybody wants to guess why that happened? Because that's how I use your product. I'm never really sitting down and using your product. I'm always on the move. If I'm seeing this on my mobile screen, if I'm seeing this on my tablet screen, I'm actually on the move. I'm never sitting down. Since this lady saw that, her testing, she never sits down and tests. She actually walks around and tests because she knows if I wanted a true user acceptance testing, is actually the way the users would be testing this thing. And this is where I justify why your testers really need to see how the users are interacting with your product. 
right? It's not about how many defects I can find. It's about what environment are our users actually using this product in, and I need to simulate that, right? Actually, there was a very funny comment that uh, the, uh, the user actually made. is like, all you guys get from me while I'm using a product is one eye and one finger. That's all you guys get from me when I'm using this thing. And that's, from then on, that's how our testers actually test our mobile view. That's how you'll be testing it. Right? They actually go outside the building now, and they walk around and they test it, or the connectivity is bad. That's how they test it. There was a fundamental shift now in the way they were looking at their product. Right? But that's not even the biggest prize. The biggest prize was the first session, they were just watching. The next time around, when we did this rapid user labs or this user lab sessions, right? what happened was the engineers, while they were watching this stuff, and one session got over, what they did was they quickly called the designer and they said, let's refine this based on what our users told us. Can we modify a few buttons here and there? And the designer kind of went at it, modified it, and the next user that came after an hour, we actually modified our prototype. And we started to get some feedback from there. The third user that came, we modified it even further and we showed them that. By the time we had our sixth user, we had pretty much nailed it down on what our users wanted all in a day. We went from an idea that we don't know if our users would like to a set of features that we are darn sure that they would love it in a day. But the real price for me was this guy, actually this guy, he actually said, wait, Kalpesh, the build in the build measure learn loop doesn't really mean I have to write a code. Build over here could mean that I built a prototype really quickly and validated it because that's the purpose of doing this thing, isn't it? I almost cried a little bit over there. I'm like, ah, oh, give me a hug. Let's bring it in, you guys. And I literally cried a little at that time because that's what the goal was. Do you know what's a measure of uh, the most innovative organizations is? The true measure of the most innovative organization is the time to first prototype. That's the true measure. The, the organization that can, is the fastest to create a prototype wins because you're in front of the users the earlier. Actually, uh, I have, has anybody heard of Pluralsight, the company Pluralsight? Yes? Uh, Nate Walkingshaw is the chief product owner of that company. Uh, and I, was, I met him in a, uh, at one of the conferences, uh, and I was sitting with him, and I was kind of asking him, how do you guys kind of go about doing this? And he said, like, we go from user story mapping, user story brainstorming, to high fidelity wireframes, to getting it in front of our customers. Do you know how much time they take? From user story mapping, coming up with user stories or features, to actually getting the prototype in front of their customers. Do you know how much time they take? Four to six hours. That is fast. That is fast. They literally start their sprint with that. We start our sprint with this is the features what we want. That day we will know what we got to work on and the rest of the sprint is where we actually build and dish it out. That is true agility. Agility wasn't about what my velocity charts look like? What do my burn downs look like? What do my throughput or my, my cycle lead times look like? That is not agility. Agility is how can I get the right stuff to my users the fastest. That is true agility. The ability of these guys to spend that day and dish out different prototypes and refine on the solution, that is true agility. That organization wins, right? So once we actually saw that, what we did was, we did empathy mapping. Does anybody know what empathy mapping is? So empathy mapping is what we do is we actually observe our users and we go back to the drawing board and say, well, what did they say about our features? What did they think about our features? What did they do with our features? What did they feel about our features, right? This was actually done, and, uh, uh, and as Richard yesterday said in his uh, keynote yesterday, they have an anthropologist, right? We actually said, let our teams do this thing. And our teams kind of went to town with that. Based on whatever they observed, they actually started writing that stuff down. Look at that number of sticky notes over there. These guys had started, really started observing what the users were saying. When you have tuned in the way your user thinks, the way your user feels about your product, thinks about their product, the way they use your product, when you have an engineering team who can do that, you've got a potent mix. That team is dangerous. That team is dangerous. So they started doing empathy mapping. And by the way, if you're wondering why is everybody wearing the same t-shirt, we actually got them t-shirts that had their outcome on it. So we kind of invested into that. Let's, let's get them t-shirts that they are wearing their outcomes on it. So that's why they have the blue t-shirts on. But the team actually started doing empathy mapping. 
they were really connected. And again, how much time does this thing take? An hour. I don't need more of your time. I just need an hour, right? So they started doing empathy mapping. But once that was done, that was just within the team. That was tribal knowledge, right? OK, so we got it. But we are, and as, as I said earlier in my slides, I'm a culture hacker. So I designed a culture hack over here. So what I did was, I said, OK, let's do something. We have a couple of options for these features that our users kind of gave feedback on. It's time to actually throw it out in the market and validate this thing, right? Has anybody heard of what multivariate testing is or A-B testing is? Who knows what A-B testing is? All right, A-B testing is where what you do is you have two versions or three versions of the same feature and you dish it out to the different population and you get feedback and see which one is the winner. So you open it up for like 1%, 2%, or 5% of the users. You open it up for them, and you see which one is the winner, which one did the population or the users like the most, and then you basically scale it from there on. Right? So you've got a winner, and then you basically build that out completely and dish it out for 100% of the population. Right? So what we did over here was we sent out a mass email to all the teams. So all the tell product teams that we had, all the leadership that was involved, we actually sent out an email saying that we are creating, tell us which design will win. So we actually had this, which design will win. We told them what our objective was. What, what is it that we are trying to accomplish with this feature? We told them what our target segment was. This is where personas kicked in. This is where they came to know what personas are we really targeting for. So we told them what our target segment was. And they had to come up with key success metrics. How would we know that this is a winner? How would we know that this is what the users really want? We know that it's crossed, crossed the threshold. Remember, the team is extremely involved. They know it from the get-go what the success metric is for this feature. And then we kind of listed out what, what is the outcome we're trying to accomplish, right? And we dished out the two options, option A, option B. And we actually had a voting thing over here. So we actually put voting thing over there. So people could actually vote. And once the people, people start voting, and we actually gave them a bribe, there was the design which would win, and whoever selected that design would actually get a prize. We actually would, would give out prize for every design that we gave out, right? So we used to give out, like, you know, you will get a bunch of candy bars, or you'll get, like, a little uh, a, a toy a Batman or something like that. We had a little toy store that we kind of put out of the place, and people who kind of gave the right answers would win. And what we did was we actually started publishing the before and after. This is what you thought was going to win, and this is what your actually users' winner came out to be. This is where the entire flow, all the product teams kind of come to know about, OK, we are slowly understanding what our users are really liking. And the teams were accountable. Actually, it's very funny. The conversations in the hallway started changing. The team members, when they were interacting with each other, they started actually asking, hey, the stuff that you, that, that you dished out uh, in the previous, which, who was the winner? What was the winner? Did it win? Did that feature win? That's the conversation that started happening. And that was the true thing that everyone discussed. They said, OK, no, well, no, it didn't really win. Well, why did it not really win? Well, because the users. The engineers were now talking about how the users were reacting to the product. And that is a culture hack. When we shifted the conversations from, should we use React or Angular, to actually the conversation shifted towards, oh, well, this feature didn't really, the users didn't really like it because of this reason. And this actually, this feature actually did off the wazoo. They did really good. Everybody loved it. We killed it. That's how we changed the conversation. That was, and it was all one simple email. It's one voting system that we sent out. And that fundamentally changed the conversation with the team. Right? So once that happened and stuff is out in the production, so I said, OK, that's great. Now let's talk about what happens in the black hole. Once stuff is released, what happens after that? Right? And how am I doing with time? I wrote that down. So, no release or launch announcement. Actually, how many of you, once you release stuff uh, into production, send out this big old email saying that, yes, we launched, we are in production. How many of you actually send out launch announcement or release announcement? Pretty much everybody of you, right? And you know, all this email chain that kind of goes back and forth saying, congratulations, great job, you guys are the best. Do you guys get that? Like 40 emails will go, and the leader will send out an email to saying, great job, you guys nailed it or whatnot, right? I said, that's nonsense. I said, that's basically saying that, so, how many of you actually have kids? Good. Uh, or you guys were kids once upon a time. When you guys actually went and gave a test and you came back home, did your parents celebrate saying that, great, you gave a test. This is awesome. We should celebrate. We should give out sweets. Or did you actually celebrate when you got good grades? It's when we got good grades, right? This is what that started. Let's stop this launch announcement. 
Because that's the fundamental thing that we are rewarding over. We are rewarding a behavior of a project on time, on budget. That is what we are rewarding over here. This was fundamentally their reward system. So I said, no launch or release announcement. And you have no idea the amount of hate I got. You have no idea the amount of hate I got. So I'm sorry. So I'm running out of time, but I'll kind of quickly go. So what we did was, we said, you know what? No launch announcements, only learning announcements. So we basically sent out saying, OK, our latest progress, latest learnings, and our game plan to address that. That's the email we started sending out. Once a month, we dish that stuff out, right? So we kind of call out, say, OK, this is the latest progress, latest learnings, and latest plans. We kind of listed out what is the purpose of our team. And then we said, progress. What all are the features that we have released so far? What were our recent learnings? Give me the exact numbers. Yes, our something went up by 30%. Uh, we had 142 BPS per uh, increase in this thing. We had 149,000 brand new recommendations or whatnot, right? This was tangible outcome. Tell me every month how much have you moved the outcome. I don't care if you were on time. I don't care if you're on budget or not. Did you move the needle or not? What did you guys learn? That is what's being, and this has actually been sent out to the entire organization, right? And based on this learning, what is your game plan? How are you going to adjust yourself? And when we started sending out this, and of course, the thank yous. Everybody wants the thank yous, right? So we started thanking out the teams or whatnot for doing this thing. But we started celebrating learnings. And then the emails changed. We started getting two kinds of emails. Hurrah, you guys got us this much money. You guys got us new, uh, new, new, new users signed up. You got our digital engagement up by something. And then emails kind of coming out, hey, why did that not work out for you guys? What really happened? Can you guys share the learnings or not? That's the kind of emails started floating around. The teams start stopped thinking about, are we on time? Did we release or not? And that the whole conversation had now shifted towards outcomes. They actually wanted, uh, we actually wanted celebrations or whatnot on how much the outcomes we had accomplished, which features and which team was ac accomplishing which outcomes by how much is what was being talked about. And that is what, was, what is being rewarded now. How much did you move the needle on the outcome? All we had to do was simple email. A simple email, and this is my perfect culture hack that I talk about. We fundamentally changed the culture. We fundamentally changed the mindset. Now the engineers are not worried about, how, hey, can, can I finish this thing? Or, or is the technology right? Or, or will we make it into production or time or not? No. Now they are worried about the questions they ask the product owner is, how much will this feature increase our outcome by? Because that is what I'm interested in. I am no longer interested in how much, how quickly can this be built, or we can, be, we can probably accomplish this in two sprints or 10 sprints. No. How much will this feature move our outcome by? Because that's what I'm getting rewarded on. I want to see thank you emails on that. Can you give me that? Right? And that's where the whole mindset has shifted now. Now these guys talk about the outcome. Uh, teams need to be measured by the successful experience in the hands of the users and not on successful delivery of the product. That is a true measure of the team. You don't measure a team by how many features they finished. You measure a team by a successful experience in the hands of the users. That is a true measure of the team. You could be dishing out stories left and right, day and night. You have a, a workshop going on all day long. But that doesn't do jack for the organization if you didn't move, move the outcome at all, if the users are still not happy. That doesn't cut it. You're in the wrong business, right? So in fact, we were so much around the outcome that we actually put our outcome results right on the, you could not even come to the floor till you have actually seen how is your stuff affect, affecting the outcome. You cannot even come upstairs. You can't even come into your office till you don't know how you're affecting. It's basically like, damn it, man, we really didn't do anything in the last release. It didn't do anything at all. Or they're like, hells yeah. I actually had people like, you see this chart? You see this yellow? My team did it. There was pride over there. And that's what even the leadership started rewarding. I mean, that's actually great information. We know that this is what the team has accomplished. There was a tremendous sense of pride. And there was a lot of trash talking, too, because the team said trash. I'm like, oh, we've accomplished so much of an outcome, and you guys haven't done jack. So there was a lot of that as well. But that's actually good, because they're talking about, they are no longer talking about release and deadlines. They're talking about outcomes and value. And that's where the conversation is. Right? So the aha moment was, 
They had many teams with many dreams, but to succeed, we needed one team with one dream. Right? We had analytics team, we have test and learn team, we have design team, we have engineering team, we have PO teams. They were all there and they were all trying to get their job done. But they were all need to be working towards one dream. That's where the success lies. If they were all, all their efforts were aligned towards that one outcome, they had to come together. They had to deliver on that outcome. That's where the success is, right? So I call this as the holy trinity. Uh, we had scrum teams when we started it, but then we kind of fundamentally shifted the composition of our scrum teams. Our scrum teams actually now have product owner, designers, and engineers. That is what the, the team structure now looks like, right? It was first, it was product owner, we had front end engineers, we had back end engineers, and that's about it, and a tester. That's our scrum team, go rock your world. Now we are saying that we don't have scrum teams, we have product teams, right? And we have supporting teams around. We actually also played with um, test and learn and analytics. What happened was the work that test and learn was doing, we pulled it into our own backlog, right? So team actually started designing those experiments themselves. And they started taking it to their backlog at all. So that team kind of went away, and now the teams are experts in test and learn. And then analytics, we kind of played with it and kind of brought them in, but we kind of brought them out. We want dedicated one person who comes to us, tells us the data, and walks away. Our actually show and tells, our sprint reviews have changed. In our show and tell, our sprint reviews, we actually talk about the engineer showcase the features. The product owner actually showcases uh, what was the impact, what was the value delivery that we had from previous releases. Analytics actually comes and shows us the numbers. This is how much we increased by. This is how much we decreased by. And designers come and show us their design visions. This is what we are taking our design towards. That is what is our show and tell now. It is no longer just engineering team put on the spot, now show us what you did. It is actually all of us coming together and saying, this is what we did towards our outcome. That is what our show and tells are now, right? Uh, so we had 12 scrum teams, but we are now 12 product teams. Right? And there is a lot of difference between just a scrum team and a product team. A product team is centered around outcome achievement. How quickly can we accomplish that outcome, right? So you would think, all right, all this stuff happened, right? So did you guys, uh, oh, so what? You changed all this stuff, so what? Our velocity didn't increase throughout this whole process. Velocity didn't increase. Throughput didn't increase. We are still dishing out the same number of stories that we were before. Throughput did not increase. There was no increase in throughput. Speed to market, our cycle lead time hasn't improved any better. It's still the same, right? So you're like, all this stuff you were harping about for the last 40 minutes, what the hell, dude, right? So what happened was our hit ratio increased. Does anybody know what hit ratio is? The success of the feature in the hand of the users was tremendously increased. Increased to the point by almost 80%. 80% of the work that we dished out was loved by the users. They loved it. Initially, it was probably 10%, 20%, 30%. The hit ratio had tremendously increased. And so was the motivation. The motivation of the team was skyrocketed. Why? Because now they were actually decision makers. They had a part, they had a stake in the outcome that they were driving. There was an equal, uh, equal seat for them on the table. I actually say that uh, product ownership is just another skill on the table for us. Product owners, engineers, designers, and analytics, we all are product owners. This is our product. We succeed together. So the motivation is off the charts for these guys. I actually read a book on the flight while I was coming over here, and that book was just published in March. It's called Smarter, Better, Faster. Uh, it's a book written by the guy who wrote Power of Habit. And that's what he says, that when you give the team the power of decision making, the motivation is off the rocket. And when I was reading that flight, I'm like, ah, I knew this. This is what we did, right? So beyond user stories, your teams are not just limited. Not, it's not just about user stories. We actually expose them to the entire journeys. They knew who the target segment. They knew what the personas were. They knew they're a part of the problem scenario design. They're part of the value proposition and assumptions. They're part of the customer uh, discovery and experimentation. And they are a part of the decision, should we pivot or persevere. It's a decision made by the team. It's not somebody higher up up there or the product owner came. We as a team decided, should we continue with this feature or should we not continue with this feature? Pivot or persevere is a decision at the ground level and not by somebody up there, right? So we basically fundamentally shifted that. So our manifesto is different. Now we say product over software. 
is what we work towards. It's not, we are not in software business. We are in the product business. We are in the experience business, right? And experiences over functionality. We are an experience business. What the functionality we dished out, what did it do for our users, right? And with that said, I'm actually taking this platform and I'm launching a campaign, right? Agile India, this floor with you guys, I am launching a campaign that says no more backlog lumberjacks. We are not backlog lumberjacks. The engineers you have in your team, they have ideas, they have suggestions, they have recommendations. They are a smart bunch of people. Utilize them. If you're just keeping them to sit there and write user stories, that's a, that's a waste, that's a colossal waste of talent. That's a colossal waste of time. That's a colossal waste of effort. These guys are smart. They have a lot of ideas. They can contribute to your product like there is no tomorrow. So that's why I'm saying they are not backlog lumberjacks. They are equal partners on the table. By the way, does anybody know what lumberjack is? How many of you don't know what a lumberjack is? So lumberjacks are basically uh, people who basically chop the wood. So they say, put the, put the wood over here, chop, next. Put the wood over here, chop, next. Put the wood over here, chop, next. That's what they thought. Actually, an uh, Indian version of that would be Koluka Bell, right? That thing is just circling around all day long. I don't know where the seeds came from. I don't know what happened to the oil or whatnot, but I just keep circling around all day long. I'm really good, Koluka Bell. I circle around 50 times. I'm faster than everybody else, but dude, I have no idea what, what happens to so no backlog lumberjacks, right? And that's my campaign. I actually have uh, laptop, laptop stickers for you guys, so please don't go grab your stickers or whatnot. And how many of you guys were so amazed by what I was doing over here that you forgot to take the notes? So if you forgot to take the notes, I have a sketch note for what my talk was, so you guys can grab it. Uh, everything that I talked about is in this sketch note, uh, and I actually have, if you are, don't be in a frenzy of taking pictures. I actually have sketch notes printed out for you guys, so you guys can grab it. Uh, I'll leave it up over here. Uh, and I also have stickers for uh, backlog lumberjacks, so please proudly put this in your laptop. And every time where somebody tells you, just finish the story, tell them, I am not a backlog lumberjack. All right? But I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Hold on. I'm loving the attention. Guys. When I went and implemented this thing, I am not empowered in any special way. I don't have special authority when I go into these teams. I don't have special place in the teams when I go into this thing, right? I am as much empowered as you guys are, right? I don't have any special authority. And just like you guys, I use my good looks and charming personality to make the change happen, right? And that's what you guys can do as well. Everything that I mentioned in this, in, in this presentation today is extremely doable by you guys. All, it's all about having one session with your team. It's all about changing the emails. It's all about launch announcement. It's all about not talking about stories, but about outcomes. Everything that I've mentioned in this session over here is doable by you guys. So I empower you guys, go out there, and please stop the backlog lumberjacks. Thank you, Agile India. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Any questions? Any questions, thoughts, suggestions? Yes, I have a question over there. And please, uh, before you leave, uh, I have stickers, so uh, Rahul, if you can help me pass the stickers around or whatnot. And I do have these awesome sketch notes, so please grab and spread them around. Uh, I'll actually pass uh, a whole bunch over here. I'll pass a whole bunch over here. Uh, but questions, so if you have any questions, please. Uh, questions, somebody had questions. Yes. Come on over here. Come on over here. Come on over here. So, 